Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Standing at 5267 Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia is a nondescript building with an otherworldly reputation. In a city with so many historic landmarks, the oddly named Grumblethorpe, said to come from a novel about a German family in England, looks like nothing more than another stone colonial structure. But tales of its spectral happenings go back over two and a half centuries and continue to this day. Grumblethorpe was built in 1744 as the summer home of John Wister. Wister was a wine merchant in the city, and his family was prominent in Philadelphia. John's brother, Casper, was a German-born glassmaker and one of the first German colonists in Pennsylvania. The Wisters would also become the namesake of the Wisteria plant. Indeed, their horticultural interests were great. Crumblethorpe included several acres of plant and flower beds and a looming ginkgo tree which still stands today. The tree is said to have grown from a seeding brought from England in 1754. Thirty years after it was completed, Grumblethorpe became the home and headquarters of British Brigadier General James Agnew, who was still recuperating from wounds sustained in the Battle of Brandywine. A few days after Agnew took up residence, the Battle of Germantown raged on October 4, 1777. Agnew rode into battle without support and was promptly ambushed by over 100 enemy troops. As he turned to escape, he was shot in the back. Agnew's soldiers and his servant, Alexander Andrew, carried the mortally wounded leader away. They took him back to Grumblethorpe, where he bled to death on the wooden floor. James Agnew reportedly haunts the home now. The bloodstain of his death still remains on the floor of Grumblethorpe, and several witnesses have claimed to see a black mist rise from that spot and move throughout the house. Others remember standing on the spot and subsequently hearing the sound of moaning, especially on the anniversary of Agnew's death. But Agnew isn't the only ethereal guest of the old house. There's another ghost referred to as Justinia Hemberger. According to legend, Justinia's father, Justin, died in the 1793 Philadelphia yellow fever epidemic. She was orphaned but taken in by the Wisters before she could be displaced. She soon became the house manager. One of Justinia's favorite pastimes was baking bread. She did so every Friday night for the purpose of distributing it to the poor on Saturday mornings. Then late one evening in 1820, Justinia appeared to John Wister's daughters in their bedroom. Believing that Justinia was at their other home on Market Street several miles away, the girls were a bit startled by her sudden presence. The following morning, the Wister family learned that Justinia had passed away the night before. Ever since her death, people have insisted that her spirit lingers in Grumblethorpe and is most often seen on Friday evenings 
after sunset, usually accompanied by the smell of freshly baked bread. She is a friendly presence and has also been seen by many children who visit the house with their parents. Aside from visitors, staff members at Grumblethorpe have had paranormal experiences that defy explanation. Education Director Diana Thompson recalled seeing a black shape low to the ground spitting very quickly from the dining room into the colonial parlor. Thompson then said, I'm not in the mood for this, after which the shape disappeared. Thompson's son also saw the same black shape. Its description matched the entity seen near James Agnew's blood spot. Other staff members have claimed to see figures or eyes in the dining room mirror. Some young volunteers have admitted that their parents are too afraid to pick them up at Grumblethorpe. Volunteer Kelly Alsop recalled a particularly unnerving experience in an upstairs room. Walking through the room with two other staff members during the middle of the day, Kelly noticed their shadows cast on the floor. But she also noticed a fourth shadow that didn't belong to anyone in the room, one that was clearly wearing a dress when everyone else was in jeans. Despite the eerie occurrences, those who work at Grumblethorpe do not feel threatened. To the contrary, workers have learned to coexist with their otherworldly guests. The house was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1972. It now operates as a museum and is open to the public. They called it the most haunted house in England. The Borley Rectory was a dark Victorian mansion in the sleepy Essex parish of Borley. Built in 1862 by the Reverend Henry Bull, the estate was beset by reports of the supernatural until its demise in 1944. Borley Rectory's paranormal activity frequently made headlines thanks to famed paranormal investigator Harry Price. There is as much that's a mystery about Harry Price, perhaps England's most famous or infamous ghost hunter, as there is quantifiable fact. Some of this confusion is due to Price's own dissembling. For instance, though Price claimed that he was born in Shropshire in 1881, he was actually born in London of that year. Whatever the truth of his origins, Price left behind a legacy that will be familiar even to many who have never heard his name. Fans of films of the paranormal or readers of the Hellboy comics have likely encountered fictionalized accounts of several of Price's cases. An amateur musician and psychic researcher, Price dedicated most of his life to studying paranormal phenomena and debunking spiritualists. The latter practice made him none too popular with many of the believers of that movement, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. After Price debunked spirit photographer William Hope, Doyle led a mass resignation of 84 members of the Society for Psychical Research and continued to hound Price for years. Unlike many magicians, however, Price was actually open to the possibilities of the paranormal and believed that some spirit mediums were genuinely legitimate. This, among other things, put him at odds with some other members of the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, which he joined in 1920. Price was also a member of the Magic Circle, an organization of stage magicians. The Ghost Club, arguably the oldest paranormal research organization in the world, and the founder of the National Laboratory of Psychical Research, which he founded as a rival to the SPR. Some of Price's most famous cases include his investigation of the medium Helen Duncan and a black magic experiment atop Mount Brocken in Germany, in which an attempt was made to transform a goat into a young man. Price claimed that he participated in the experiment, known as the Blocksburg Trist, only to prove the fallacy of transcendental magic. Price also investigated Jeff the Talking Mongoose in the 1930s, Jeff supposedly inhabited the farmhouse of the Irving family on the Isle of Man, though Price's investigations alleged that the hair and paw prints of the mongoose were actually from a dog and that the talking 
was produced by hollow walls in the house, which makes the whole house one great speaking tube, with walls like sounding boards. In 1927, Price claimed that he'd come into possession of a box left behind by self-styled religious prophetess Joanna Southcott, which she had left behind after her death in 1814. Along with the box, Southcott had left instructions that it should be opened at a time of national crisis, and only in the presence of every bishop of the Church of England. Price opened the box, in the presence of only the reluctant bishop of Grantham, and found that it contained only a few odds and ends, including a lottery ticket and a horse pistol. Followers of Southcott, known as Southcottians, maintain that the box Price opened was a fraud. As recently as the 1970s, a Southcottian group called the Panacea Society claimed to be in possession of the actual box and placed advertising campaigns that pushed to have the box opened under the conditions set forth by Joanna Southcott. Price's most famous case was his study of Borley Rectory, which he called the most haunted house in England. The first ghostly sighting associated with the Borley Rectory, which was erected on top of an old monastery, occurred in 1863. Townsfolk attributed it to a nun from a nearby town who had fallen in love with a monk. Local lore had it that they were caught trying to elope, and the monk was executed while the nun was boarded up in the cellar to die. On July 28, 1900, four of Reverend Bull's daughters reported seeing the ghost of the nun gliding across the estate, the first of several encounters. Sightings grew stranger for the Bull family and included a coach driven by headless horsemen racing down the property. When Reverend Henry Bull died in 1892, his son Harry, also a reverend, took over the rectory until his own death on June 9, 1928. A new man of the cloth moved in a few months later. Reverend Eric Smith and his wife experienced ghostly lights and bells, spectral footsteps, and Mrs. Smith even found a skull wrapped in a paper bag while cleaning out the kitchen. All of this prompted the couple to contact the Daily Mirror in an attempt to reach the Society for Psychical Research. An article entitled Tales of Headless Coachman and a Lonely Nun made the newspaper on June 10, 1929 and two days later, a soon-to-be famous paranormal researcher named Harry Price visited the home to investigate. At the same time, other researchers began to investigate the claims made by Price and Marianne. Some speculated that the reports were falsified to cover up Marianne's infidelity, and it later came to light that the Reverend's wife was having an affair with a boarder named Frank Peerless. The Foister's family tenure at Borley Rectory lasted until 1935. With the mansion now unoccupied, Price decided to rent the home for one year so that he could continue his investigations uninterrupted. Through an ad in the Times, he found nearly 50 willing participants who would live in the dwelling and document their findings. Price's studies at Borley Rectory advanced his career and solidified his reputation as a preeminent researcher in the paranormal community. He came up with the idea of a ghost hunter's kit which included tape measures to gauge the thickness of walls, cameras to capture proof, portable phones to facilitate communication between multiple researchers, and remote-controlled equipment so he could record activity from a distance. Out of this year-long research, seances were performed and two ghosts were discovered by the team. The first was a French nun who was identified as Marie. It was she who was buried alive and who pleaded for help through messages on the wall. The second ghost had a foreboding message. Sonex Amures warned that he would set fire to the rectory on March 27, 1938, and that the remains of a murdered individual would be revealed. Price concluded his research and left the mansion shortly thereafter. In 1939, the rectory's new owner knocked over an oil lamp while unpacking boxes, resulting in a fire that gutted the building. The insurance company would later conclude that the fire was deliberately set. During the blaze, a woman who lived nearby said that she saw a figure of a ghostly nun in an upstairs window and demanded money from Harry Price for her story. Price returned to Borley to sort through the wreckage. In 1943, he announced that he had unearthed the bones of a young woman. Price held up the bones as conclusive proof of the ghostly nun. 
By this time, however, locals and the paranormal research community had grown skeptical of Price. The bones were eventually given proper burial, though not in the parish of Borley, where local opinion held that they were the bones of a pig. Instead, Price went to a nearby town to do the deed. After Price's death in 1948, the SPR conducted their own study investigating Price's claims about Borley Rectory. In what came to be called the Borley Report, the SPR concluded that Price had faked many of the phenomena or that they were due to natural causes. Meanwhile, psychic researcher John L. Randall claimed that dirty tricks had been played on Price by members of the SPR during his residency at Borley. Whatever the truth of Price's life and cases, perhaps the greatest legacy he left to the world of paranormal research was his extensive collection of writings on magic and psychic phenomena, which make up the Harry Price archives at the University of London, as well as the Harry Price Library of Magical Literature, housed at the Senate House Library. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Many years back, I worked security work in Sydney, Australia. As often happens, you do a lot of night work, along with the late hours and strange people at that time, and the otherworldly. I worked with a fellow guard, and we got to discussing the building's resident. After explaining that story to him, he then opened up about his time at the State Library of New South Wales. He told me of the night New Year's Eve 2000, when sitting in the control room, he and another guard noticed a rather attractive young woman in period dress, crossing the main yard. It was gated and closed to the public, so they radioed the guard on patrol and dispatched him to the area to escort her out and to check to see the main gates were secured. As they watched, the guard came into view on the left monitor while the young woman was still moving across the other monitor as they followed her camera to camera. As the patrol guard approached he radioed in asking where the woman was and were they playing games as he couldn't see her. The control room radioed back, stating that she was right in front of him and counted down the distance – five meters, four meters, three, and so on. Then the guard says, you're kidding me, there's no one, and then goes, holy, that got cold, what in the… As my partner reiterated that he and the other guard with him watched the two walk right through each other. Well, that guard ran back to the office and dropped his radio and keys off and quit that night. On the warm summer night of July 5th, 1919, the body of 21-year-old Bella Wright was found on a little-traveled road in Little Stretton, England, a small township near Leicester. Her bike was nearby, and there was a bullet wound in her head. She had last been seen by her uncle earlier that evening with a man with a green bicycle. This man would later be identified as Ronald Light, a 34-year-old World War I veteran. Bella was a young woman of the working class, the first of seven children of an illiterate farmhand and his wife. She went to school until she was 12, 
and then transitioned to working in order to help her family, first as a domestic servant and then as a factory worker. She typically stayed close, riding her bicycle the five miles between work and home. On the night of her murder, the young woman had been traveling to see her uncle, George Measure, when her front bicycle tire came loose. A passing stranger, now known to be Mr. Light, stopped to help her out. When he did not have the necessary tools for the job, he offered to accompany her on her way. They arrived together at Measure's home. The uncle would later describe Light as unnerving. But once the bike was fixed, his niece and the seemingly helpful stranger rode off together. The time was approximately 8.50 p.m. Just half an hour later, at 9.20 p.m., a local farmer named Joseph Cowell happened upon Bella's overturned bike and her motionless body on the quiet country lane. He immediately called for help, summoning both the local doctor and police constable Alfred Hall. It was, of course, too late for the doctor's services, and his candlelit autopsy of the body pronounced her dead from a bicycle accident. Police Constable Hall, however, wasn't so sure. In the morning, he returned to the nearby church where Bella's body had been moved to more closely examine the results of her accident. Wiping blood and matted hair away from her face, he saw the clear mark of a bullet wound and knew suddenly that her death had been a murder. A trip back to the site where her body was found revealed a 45 caliber bullet confirming his suspicions. The story quickly spread, as did George Measure's description of the mysterious man and his bicycle with unusually shaped handlebars. A poster was made and all were told to be on the lookout for either the described man or, notably, his green bicycle. It wasn't until February of the following year that any progress was made on the matter. It was at this point that, in a serendipitous accident, the tow rope of a coal barge snagged an important piece of debris from the bottom of the river soar. It was the frame of the green bicycle. The remaining bits were hauled up as well and investigators were able to identify the bicycle, despite it being dismantled with many of the serial numbers shaved off as belonging to one Ronald Light. Later, a laborer by the name of Samuel Holland would come forward stating that he saw Light dismantle the bike and toss it into the river piece by piece from the Upperton Road Bridge in Leicester. Also pulled from the same river, an Army-issued pistol holster and 45 caliber bullets, matching the bullet at the scene of the crime. Light was arrested on March 4, 1920. He claimed he was innocent of Bella's murder. He admitted he had been with her on the night of her death, but that he had split ways with her upon leaving her uncle's home. He cited his ailing mother as the reason that he had not come forward as being the man with the green bicycle and for having attempted to dispose of that evidence. He even admitted to being the owner of the found holster as well as having owned a revolver. In short, he admitted to everything, except for the actual murder. At his trial that summer, Light appeared to be quite the gentleman. The facts presented against him, however, painted a different story. Along with all of the evidence to which he had admitted, it was found that Light had also had several incidents in the past, including run-ins with the law. He'd been fired from a number of positions, had a seemingly unhealthy fascination with fire, having attempted to light offices and a row of haystacks, and had been accused of inappropriate conduct towards girls and young women over a number of years and in a variety of settings. In every incident, no charges were brought against him. Despite this damning information, Light's strategic lawyer, Sir Edward Marshall Hall, who coincidentally would earn the nickname the Great Defender from his successful representation of people accused of horrendous murders, presented his client as a trustworthy teacher, army man, and community member. He also offered the court a story which excluded Light from having any murderous motive. The young woman, so Sir Edward suggested, had likely been shot accidentally from at a great distance, not close range as Light was accused. It seemed like an obvious conviction, but Light's professional and calm demeanor, combined with the theory that a close-range shot would have more grotesquely disfigured the victim's face, provided the jury with enough reason to acquit the man. Light walked free, 
and Bella's family and community were left wondering what happened during the last half hour of her life. Now, exactly 100 years later, the case remains unsolved. After his acquittal, Light moved away, changed his name, and married. He lived a quiet life, dying in 1975 at the age of 89. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Ghosts might be one thing, but demons are something else entirely. A demon is a fallen angel, a supernatural and malevolent entity that exists in many religions around the world under different names. In the Bible, they're described as angels who were hurled down to earth along with Satan, whose sole purpose now is to revolt against God's plan and his people. In the New Testament, Jesus was said to have driven out many demons. Matthew 8, verse 29, "'What do you want with us, Son of God?' the demons shouted. "'Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time?' Demons are mostly known to possess individuals, but there have also been many claims of demons infesting homes. That is to say, there are stories of such events. As with most things of this nature, there are no concrete answers either. Here are a few of the reported causes for demonic infestation. Dealing with the occult or practicing black magic. Using a Ouija board. Some believe Ouija boards may invite negative entities into our world. This is the reason that many warn against using a Ouija board at all. Summoning a demon. Yes, people attempt this sometimes, and it does what it says on the box, if stories are to be believed probably not something you should try, ever. And negative energy. Overwhelming stress, anger, and other negative human emotions may catch the attention of a demon and perhaps allow it an easy route into your life. Those might be the reasons why a demon would decide to bunk with you. But let's take a look at some of the common symptoms of demonic infestation. Things you should perhaps look out for strange noises. They aren't like the clanging chains and soft whispers in horror movies. The sound of a demon is said to be guttural, a harsh growling unlike anything an ordinary animal could produce. This may occur in specific spots such as closets or hallways. You may even hear strained words over your shoulder, asking you questions or threatening you in some way. Other sounds may occur as well, including banging or stomping and scratching on walls. Scared animals. Many believe animals can see ghosts, your pets included. When a dog starts barking at empty air, he or she may have witnessed a passing spirit. But you also have those cases when the animal is afraid, terrified even, growling at an unseen force hidden from human eyes your pet may begin acting aggressively for no apparent reason, and there are even some cases in which a pet has reportedly fallen ill during a demonic attack. 
In his book, True Tales of the Ouija Board, Stephen Wagner relates one such incident, during which a group of girls were playing with a Ouija board. All was well until they contacted a spirit that unexpectedly mentioned their dogs. When they asked the spirit what it meant, it simply replied, you will see. Not long after, the girls heard their dogs screaming outside. They later found a mysterious burn mark on one of the dogs. Mysterious Shadows The presence of shadow people might be a sign that a demon lurks nearby. In some cases, the shadows take humanoid forms, but they've also appeared as animals, or even simply amorphous blobs that don't resemble anything at all. One case of a potential demon involving a shadow person was reported by a Reddit user several months ago. While sleeping one night at her grandparents' house during a sleepover when she was very young, the witness was shocked awake, only to glimpse a dark silhouette in the chair on the other side of the room. It was awkwardly positioned, sideways, with its arms holding its legs up to its chest. Having been taught a little about Christianity by her parents, at first she thought it could be Jesus or some other positive entity. But just as she thought that name, the shadow figure lurched up out of the chair faster than anything humanly could and approached her. The figure watched her and then began doing something very odd. It started scratching at its own calves, tearing at its own flesh, if it even had any. The witness tried to calm down and eventually fell asleep, if that's what it was. It was like time had warped in some way. She woke up the next morning, but not before she felt a strange breath upon her ear. Demonic Nightmares Dreams are interesting things. They can tell us a lot about who we are and what our subconscious minds are really thinking. They can also, perhaps, act as windows into a world just beyond our own. But that's not always a world we want to enter. Many have reported having strange and terrible dreams that accompany the unexplained activity in their homes during a haunting, particularly those involving demons. About a year ago, for example, another Reddit user posted his experience with what he believed was such a demon. It was in early October and he had just gone to sleep after a very tiring day. That's when he had what he described as the worst dream he would ever experience in his life. It involved something indiscernible but horrifying. It hovered over his bed, glaring down at him with a disgusted look, whispering something he couldn't quite make out. The dream ended with him waking up hours later exhausted and sweating. He went out for a walk to clear his head, but when he returned, he found his door wide open, and that was only the beginning of his demonic experiences. He go on to witness many of the signs on this list, the loud bangs, the shadows, and even two red eyes staring at him in the darkness. Damage to Religious Symbols Demons don't take kindly to holy symbols. They may attempt to destroy crucifixes, Bibles, rosaries, or other religious artifacts, anything that could act as a threat against their presence. A Foul Stench One of the most common signs of a demonic infestation is a terrible, putrid smell, the scent of decomposition or rotting eggs, sulfur, the scent of death. One idea is that the sulfur smell is actually a reaction that demons or other negative entities have to divinity. This smell occurs, some say, when the demon is upset or when the area they are inhabiting has been blessed or cleansed. A Streak of Bad Luck Parasitic or negative entities may latch onto people, draining them of their energy. They're said to cause all sorts of unexplained symptoms, including drained emotions, mood swings, and bad luck. Accidents may occur frequently, but there may be more to this seeming pattern of bad luck than meets the eye. A demonic attachment might be at fault. Friendly Visitations Demons are deceptive. One of the main reasons people warn others against the use of Ouija boards is that oftentimes they believe any spirit that appears friendly 
or is claiming to be a deceased family member, is likely a demon lying to you. They're telling you what you want to hear, making it easier to take control. This can be seen in reports of the demon Zozo, a fiend that seemingly enjoys pretending to be familiar spirits contacting users through the Ouija board. But sooner or later, the Ouija demon reveals itself as the malevolent force that it is, causing havoc in the lives of anyone who dares test it. Physical and Psychological Disturbances Have you ever been scratched by an otherworldly force? A spiritual attack is said to occur when the victim experiences scratches, bite marks, and other wounds without any ordinary explanation. They may happen anywhere on the body or even on objects around the house, tiny mysterious scratches that seem to defy all rationality. In the case of a demon, like the aforementioned knocking, three scratch or claw marks are said to serve as a mockery of the Holy Spirit, but scratches aren't the only sign of a demon. A person may feel odd sensations like he or she's being watched. Feelings of unease or even outright nausea and other forms of illness also have been reported. The goal, it would seem, is to wear a person down to make possession easier. And then, demonic possession itself. Demonic possession is a topic all by itself, but suffice to say a demon's presence in a home or attachment to an object may very well be a precursor to the full-on possession of a human. That may in fact be the entire purpose, what the demon wanted from the very beginning, a vessel. In the famous or infamous story of Annabelle, when Ed and Lorraine Warren first visited the two women and their curious Raggedy Ann doll, they say they knew immediately that they were dealing with a demonic attachment. The demon was only pretending to be the spirit of a young girl attached to the doll, but in reality it was attempting to be welcomed and accepted into their lives, after which it planned to possess one of them. The Warrens refer to this process as invitation, obsession, infestation, oppression, and possession. With rampant growth of the occult and Satanism in our societies, and with the exploding popularity of New Age spiritualism, the spirit world is receiving more attention than ever before. But is there a spirit world? Are evil spirits real? If so, what are they? Where did they come from? And what about demon possession? Does this phenomenon really exist in our world today? According to 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, now the spirit speaketh that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So warns your Bible. But what are seducing spirits and doctrines of demons? Most psychologists and many theologians believe demons to be mere figments of the imagination and regard demon possession as nothing more than an unscientific way of explaining mental illness. But does the Bible support such views? Proponents of the New Age, on the other hand, believe very much in the existence of a spirit world. New Agers claim to have achieved enlightenment and inner peace through contact with spirit guides whom they believe to be the spirits of the dead. Are these spirit guides really the disembodied spirits of human beings? Or are they figments of the imagination? Or are they something else? What about this so-called New Age? Is it really new? And what of the widespread practice of witchcraft, Satanism, necromancy, transcendental meditation, divination, and other forms of the occult? Are these mere passing fancies fads? that are not to be taken seriously? Actually, all the spiritualistic crafts and arts we hear so much about today are nothing more than modern manifestations of very ancient practices, practices absolutely condemned in God's Word. Moreover, they are tampering with spiritual powers that could literally wreck their lives. 
Many people, including theologians from various denominational backgrounds, believe that evil spirits belong to the world of superstition and myth. Satan is nothing more than a literary device, a personification of evil, and demons are mental and emotional disorders such as schizophrenia, paranoia, and psychoneurosis. The many scriptures attesting to the existence of supernatural evil are either rejected as myth or viewed as allegory. The devil of Christ's temptation in Matthew chapter 4, for example, is nothing more than the human side of Christ's nature or, according to one interpretation, an unnamed human devil, a representative of Herod, who offers provincial authority to Jesus if he will but do homage to the Roman governor. According to this thinking, demons or evil spirits were conjured by primitive imagination. Today, we understand them as mental and emotional disorders. Satan is seen as a parabolic rather than diabolic character, an emblem of evil, a literary personification. As wisdom is personified in Scripture, Proverbs chapter 8, so is evil. As gods are conceived in ignorance and superstition, so are demons. Such reasoning may appeal to some, but if we are honest with the Scriptures, if we accept the Bible as the inspired Word of God, then we should be willing to lay aside our personal ideas and believe what the Bible plainly reveals. The truth is, all attempts to see demons and the devil as mere mental diseases and the personification of evil are really attempts to rationalize something that seems irrational. But the Bible's clear, Satan is a literal personal being, and demons are spiritual personalities that think, reason, speak, and express fear, and under certain conditions can enter into and possess the mind of a human being. When Christ confronted a man possessed by a legion of demons in Mark chapter 5, the evil spirits exhibited their ability to think, reason, and speak by imploring Christ not to send them out of the country but into a nearby herd of swine instead. James says that demons believe in God and tremble, according to James chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus cast out as many devils or demons and suffered or allowed not the devils to speak because they knew him. Mark 1, verse 34. In some cases, the demons came out crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God, Luke chapter 4, verse 41, showing that demons are intelligent beings with cognitive and communicative abilities. Demon intelligence was again exhibited when seven Jewish exorcists attempted to cast out an evil spirit in the name of Jesus. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. It was the evil spirit that spoke, not the man in whom the evil spirit was. Evidently, the difference between mental illness and demonic possession was acknowledged during the first century. Matthew speaks of those which were possessed with devils or demons and those which were lunatic, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, apparently recognizing that insanity and demonic possession are not necessarily the same. It is clear, then, that demons are literal beings, not mental disorders. Virtually every culture in the history of mankind has believed in the existence of spirits, both good and evil. Such spirits have been called gods, have been venerated and feared, have been regarded the spirits of ancestors, of animals, and of the wicked dead. Throughout the ages, men have attempted to appease the spirits, have sought guidance, protection, good luck, and personal power from them, have created rites and rituals to ward off evil spirits. The Greek word daemon, from which we derive demon, originally had a good as well as a bad connotation. Socrates, for example, was thought to have a daemon or familiar spirit that warned him when he was about to make a wrong decision. Many tribal cultures believe that evil spirits are the hostile spirits of deceased ancestors. Ancestral worship and various rites of exorcism have emerged from this belief. 
Ancient Greeks and Romans believed that evil spirits were the ghosts or souls of the wicked dead and were to be feared. Such ideas about evil spirits spilled over into Judaism. Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, apparently believed that demons are no other than the spirits of the wicked which enter into men that are alive and kill them unless they can obtain some help against them. Some even today believe that demons are the spirits of the offspring of unions between angels and antediluvian women. This belief is based on a misinterpretation of Genesis chapter 6, where we read of the sons of God who married the daughters of men. Proponents of this theory say that the sons of God were angels, since angels are sometimes called sons of God, and the daughters of men were, of course, human beings. However popular this idea is destroyed by Christ's assertion that resurrected saints are equal, like or as the angels, in that they neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. In today's world, where gods and spells have been replaced by science and technology, except among New Agers and occultists, demons are often associated with superstition and myth, and are believed to have been conceived in the imaginations of men who lacked scientific understanding. The Bible has little to say on the origin of demons, but the little it does say provides us with information sufficient for deriving reasonable conclusions about what demons are and why they exist. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the devil and his angels are engaged in supernatural warfare with the archangel Michael and his celestial armies. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's Satan, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7, 8, and 9. This particular prophecy has yet to be fulfilled, but scripture evidence indicates that this, as many other prophecies, has dual meaning where a past occurrence is used to describe a future event. This implies that the devil and his angels have already been cast out of heaven, and from all indications it happened long ago, even before the creation of Adam. The angels that sinned, then, are the angels who followed Satan in his rebellion, whose expulsion from heaven is used in Revelation as a type, a representation of a future event. The main point is that Satan the devil has angels, and the devil's angels are the evil spirits the Bible calls demons. They are the angels that followed Satan in his rebellion. No other explanation for the existence of demons agrees with God's revealed word. So yes, demons do exist. They have been active on this earth for millennia, as we have seen. But what kinds of problems do they cause? Are there different kinds of demons? Are some more aggressive than others? And what about mental illness? How does that differ from demon possession? Jesus gave his twelve disciples power and authority over all devils or demons and to cure disease. Luke 9, verse 1. Jesus also gave others, over 70 people, given them the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy which the enemy, of course, is Satan, and they had used that power and had cast out demons in Jesus' name. But on one occasion, his disciples were unable to cast out an evil spirit. After Jesus cast the spirit out, in Mark chapter 9, verses 17 and 18, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus answered, this kind come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Notice the words, this kind. This implies that there are different kinds of demons. In this case, the demon appears to have been a particularly stubborn, aggressive kind. Some demons are more aggressive, hateful, vengeful than others, and different demons affect the people they possess in different ways. The following are some of the ways demons affect their hosts. Some demons attempt to hurt harm, or destroy the person they possess. In the example I just cited, 
The demon often would throw the possessed person into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Mark chapter 9 verse 22. The man possessed by the legion in Mark chapter 5 was always night and day in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Some demons cause physical impairments such as dumbness or muteness, deafness and blindness. They brought to him a dumb or mute man possessed with a devil or demon, and when the devil was cast out, the dumb spoke. Matthew chapter 9 verses 32 and 33. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spoke and saw. Matthew 12 verse 22. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Mark 9, verse 25. Some demons exhibit their supernatural powers through miracles and oratory messages. The Apostle Paul confronted a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying in the book of Acts, chapter 16. In the end time, the spirits of devils will go forth, working miracles according to Revelation. The miracles of demons often include such phenomena as levitation, telekinesis, mind reading, and automatic writing. Perhaps even greater wonders will commonly occur in the end of the present age, when the devil and his angels are cast down to this earth. Demon-possessed persons sometimes display extraordinary physical strength. In the case of the man possessed by the legion, no man could bind him, not even with chains because he'd often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Mark chapter 5. Some demons are foul spirits. We read of these in Mark chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 18. Apparently they are considered foul or unclean because they cause the people they possess to exhibit immoral, perhaps perverse, behavior and spew out vile, filthy language and obscenities. Very often, demons cause the persons they possess to appear insane. This may not be true of every case, but it is certainly true of many. The man with the legion and the boy who was thrown in the fire and in the water are a couple of examples. In addition to the previous facts about demon possession, the scriptures also reveal that multiple possessions, when a person is possessed by several demons at the same time, occasionally occurs. When Christ cast out the legion, the demons went into a herd of swine, and the whole herd, about 2,000, ran into the sea and drowned. The number of swine may indicate how many demons had possessed the man. In any case, the name Legion indicates at least more than one or two, or even seven, which was the number Jesus had cast out of Mary Magdalene in Mark chapter 16. Some present-day cases of split personality could be demonic possessions. Distinguishing between possession and mental illness, though, is often difficult. The rule of thumb is most cases of mental illness are not cases of demon possession. However, Where there are marked changes in personality, not the occurrence of despondency, depression, or anxiety, the onset of sudden bouts of violent hostility, or the occurrence of supernatural phenomena in the vicinity of the person in question, then demon possession is a very real possibility. But be careful about jumping to conclusions, and don't go looking for an exorcist when such cases arise. The psychiatric evaluation of a trained professional is the first course of action you should pursue. Well, now that we know what demons are and what they're capable of doing, let's take a look at what they are not. Some people speak of lust demons or jealousy demons or pride demons. Such terminology indicates a basic misunderstanding about the nature of demons and the effect of demon possession and often provides a scapegoat for the sinner. It is certainly true that evil spirits are capable of subjecting men to temptation, Matthew chapter 4, or have a leading role in much of this world's wickedness, Ephesians chapter 6, but problems involving lust, pride, jealousy, and other components of man's nature do not indicate demon possession. 
The book of James says, "...but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed." Lust is one of the components of human nature. It resides within us all. To blame one's lust problems on a demon is to remove the blame from one's self, where it belongs. Moreover, it is a mistake to see demons lurking behind every bush, or to assume demon influence or possession every time something strange happens. Most unidentified flying objects, strange noises, and creaking floors are not the result of demonic activity or even paranormal activity. Most mental and emotional illnesses are not brought on by demons. But by assuming that demons are to blame for our sins, our pride, jealousy, covetousness, or hot-headed temper and impatience, we're depriving ourselves of any real success in spiritual and personal growth and development. The drives and emotions involved in problems such as these do not warrant expulsion. They call for a firmly established set of priorities, for a disciplined life, and for time. This is not to say that demons do not exert an influence in the evils of this world. Indeed, they do. But influence and possession are two entirely different manifestations of demonic activity. In possession, the evil spirit inhabits and takes control of the mind of its victim. In cases of demonic influence, however, the spirit is able to put certain thoughts into a person's mind, but does not inhabit and control the mind. The Apostle Paul links course of this world with the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2. This suggests that the devil, and by extension, the whole demonic realm, is a major causal factor behind the evils of this world. It also provides an important clue on how to avoid demonic influence. Do not follow the course of this world. Do not become a child of disobedience. Rather, follow Christ. Obey God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James chapter 4. The devil and his demented cohorts, the demons, are the rulers of the darkness of this world, according to Ephesians chapter 6, but they cannot rule those who submit to God's rule. From the New Testament record, we deem that demon possession was fairly common in the first century. Perhaps this phenomenon was partly due to a considerably widespread fascination with the black arts, spiritualism, necromancy, magic, divination, etc. Evidence of this fascination is found in Acts chapter 19, where we find the Apostle Paul in the city of Ephesus, the capital of the Roman province of Asia. In this account, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. That's verses 11 and 12. He then follows the case of the seven Jewish exorcists who attempt to cast out a demon by Jesus whom Paul preacheth and failed miserably. When the citizens of Ephesus heard of what had happened, fear fell on them and the name of the Lord, Jesus, was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. The fascination with the curious arts does not account for all cases of demon possession in the ancient world, but it undoubtedly accounts for many such cases. It's a well-known fact that even in our time, demon possession is far more common among the people of lands where the black arts are commonly practiced than in the United States and other Christian nations. However, evidence of demonic activity, including actual cases of possession in the United States and other English-speaking countries, has increased since the arrival of the New Age movement, with the spread of occult practices and Satanism. Demon possession is a very real phenomenon in today's world, and so is the practice of exorcism, rituals, prayers, incantations, and special methods used in the expulsion of evil spirits from possessed persons. This curious art was well known among both Jews and pagans in ancient times. Some Jewish rabbis still practice exorcism, as do Hindus and Muslims. 
In some pagan exorcisms, the possessed person is tortured based on the belief that the possessing spirit can be afflicted and thus driven out by afflicting the body of the possessed. Apparently, and for whatever reason, a certain degree of success has been achieved through the use of such cruel techniques. The exorcism rites of ancient Jews were apparently borrowed from pagan cultures. Josephus tells of an exorcism wherein the demon was drawn through the nostrils of the possessed person by use of a special method allegedly handed down from Solomon. The rite consisted of a special nose ring and incantations allegedly composed by Solomon himself. Of course, no such rites appear in the Law of Moses and are nowhere authorized by Scripture. If the exorcism ritual described by Josephus was indeed composed by Solomon, then it was composed in his latter years, while he was under the influence of his heathen wives. Many cases of possession and exorcism have been documented in the professing Christian world as well. Malachi Martin, Catholic scholar and former Jesuit professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, recounts five American cases of possession and exorcism in his book Hostage to the Devil. Before detailing the events of the five cases, Martin states that the cases are true and that his accounts are based on extensive interviews with persons directly and indirectly involved and on tapes made during the exorcisms. The chapters that follow recount some of the most chilling events imaginable. The aberrant behavior of the possessed, as well as the supernatural phenomena occurring during exorcism, are in some ways similar to the fictional story of Reagan, the 12-year-old demoniac of the film The Exorcist. According to Martin's research, some of the physical phenomena frequently associated with possession include the inexplicable stench which permeates the room where the exorcism is performed, freezing temperatures in the room, though other parts of the house are warm, telepathic powers about purely religious and moral matters, a peculiar unlined or completely smooth or stretched skin, or unusual distortion of the face or other physical and behavioral transformations, possessed gravity, the possessed person becomes physically immovable, or those around the possessed are weighed down with a suffocating pressure, levitation, the possessed rises and floats off the ground, the chair or the bed, there's no physical traceable support, violent smashing of furniture, constant opening and slamming of doors, tearing of fabric in the vicinity of the possessed without a hand laid on them, and so on. Before the exorcism rites begin, loose objects are removed from the room. During the exorcism, one form of violence may and most often does cause an object, light or heavy, to move about, rock back and forth, skitter or fly across the room, make much noise, strike the priest or the possessed or the assistants. It is not rare for people to emerge from an exorcism with serious physical wounds. Diocesan authorities usually appoint a junior priest colleague to assist the exorcist and to receive training as an exorcist. His role is to monitor the words and actions of the exorcist, warn him if he's making a mistake, help him if he weakens physically, and replace him if he dies, collapses, flees, is physically or emotionally battered beyond endurance, and all have happened during exorcisms. Others are also appointed to assist the exorcist in his grueling task. Martin writes, the exorcist must be as certain as possible beforehand that his assistants will not be weakened or overcome by obscene behavior or by language foul beyond their imagining. They cannot blanch at blood, excrement, urine. They must be able to take awful personal insults and be prepared to have their darkest secrets screeched in public in front of their companions. These are routine happenings during exorcisms. Even with all the care in the world, Martin states, there is no way an exorcist can completely prepare his assistants for what lies in store for them. Even though they are not subject to the direct and unremitting attack the priest will undergo, it is not uncommon for assistants to quit or be carried out in the middle of an exorcism. According to Martin, exorcisms commonly last 10 to 12 hours, but some continue for several days and a few last for weeks. Once begun, Martin explains, except on the rarest occasions, there are no timeouts 
Although one or other of the people present may leave the room for a few minutes to take some food, to rest very briefly, or go to the bathroom. Exorcisms are not only stressful for the possessed, but for the exorcism teams as well. In People of the Lie, author M. Scott Peck, M.D., discusses the two exorcisms he has personally witnessed. One lasted four days, the other lasted three days, he says, and both were successful. And even though the outcome was successful, he writes, most members of the exorcism teams had emotional reactions to contend with in the weeks afterward. Dr. Peck is not certain about which comes first, involvement in the occult or demon possession. But one thing is certain, there is a definite connection between the two. Peck writes, it seems clear from the literature on possession that the majority of cases have had involvement with the occult. Both the patients in the exorcisms he witnessed had been involved in the occult. In one patient, the process seemed to begin with involvement in the occult at the age of 12. In the other, the process apparently began at the age of 5 with something more ghastly than what one would ordinarily consider a cult. The lesson is clear. If you value your life, your sanity, your mental and emotional health and well-being, then stay away from the occult. Avoid anything that resembles the occult, including New Age spiritualism. Remember, God utterly condemns such things, and there are other preventative steps that you can take. The following is a summarization of the things you can do to protect yourself from demonic activity. As stated above, avoid all forms of the occult and New Age spiritualism. Also be aware of the harmful effects of drugs, cocaine, heroin, etc., and heavy metal music. Most drug addicts and heavy metal fans are not demon-possessed, but the connection of drug abuse and heavy metal with the occult and with aberrant behavior, depression, and suicidal tendencies cannot be ignored. Ancient mediums used mood-inducing substances and environments to prepare their minds for contact with the spirit world. Their modern-day counterparts are still using drugs. Practice Emotional Control Fits of blind rage, uncontrolled anger, and prolonged temper tantrums may lead to demon possession. Be aware of the existence of demons and the reality of demon influence and possession, but do not become preoccupied with them and do not search for evidence of demonic activity. Most strange occurrences are not demonic in origin, and most mental patients are not possessed. Assuming demonic activity where none exists is more harmful than helpful. Follow the principles of God's Word. God's laws were intended to be beneficial to man. Obedience to them produces happiness, well-being, and true peace of mind. Put your trust in the promises of God's Word. James writes, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, verse 7. Paul says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul's words go hand in hand with the promises Jesus gives to those who follow him. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, he says. Go ye therefore and teach, make disciples of all nations, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Think of it. An exorcist of our time spends long, grueling hours, which may expand into days and weeks, trying to expel a single demonic spirit. He risks injury and emotional impairment during the ordeal. And when it's over, he may require some weeks in recovering from the incredibly demanding experience. But Jesus, who cast out more demons than any exorcist ever has, did not need long hours to accomplish the task. He required no period of recovery, no therapy, once a demon was cast out. He employed no rituals, no special incantations. A single command, come out, brought instant results. On one occasion, a whole legion of demons fled at his command. What power! And that same power provides comfort and assurance to Christ's followers today. 
For the Christ who with but a single command cast out a multitude of evil spirits is the same Christ who promises, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. To have Him with us, all we need to do is follow Him, walk down the path He carved, follow the way of life He proclaimed. In the scriptures, both Christ and the path He carved are called the way. And when it comes to guarding the door of your mind, there is no better way. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.